and we're going to do, um, we're going to explore, if you would, with us today, the identity of a very strange name and the development of the history of religion, excuse me, in, um, in a way that many of us have never understood it before. There's the name, Zoroaster. You see, you look and say, who, who is that? What is Zoroaster? Let me put it this way. You would not have a Christian religion if it wasn't for Zoroaster. You would not have a Jewish religion if it wasn't for Zoroaster. You would not have a religious tradition if it wasn't for Zoroaster. And when you begin to understand that, then it serves well to stop for just a moment and take a look and say, you know, who is this? There's a professor by the name of Edward Mayer, and he termed Zoroaster thusly, the first personality to have worked creatively, creatively and formatively upon the course of religious history. Now, when you think of Zoroaster, understand him as a prophet, as a Christ, a messenger of God. But the God that he was the messenger for is one that you've never heard before. The name is Ahura Mazda. Ahura Mazda. That's the name of God. Okay. Through every religion, through Christianity, through every nationality, the words, the teachings of Zoroaster pervade. Everywhere. Hebrew, Greek, Latin. Let me show you something. The religions of India said, the world is the way it is. You can know it, but you can't change it. And for many of us, that's the way it's always been. That's the way it is. You know, what am I going to do about it? What can I do? Can't do anything. I'm stuck in it. Zoroaster said, the world was corrupt, not by nature, but by accident, and the world is to be reformed by human wisdom. In other words, there is something you can do about it. You can sit, and you can go to church, and you can read Bibles, and you'll get old, and you'll die, and you've done nothing. Or, you can understand and start to develop that which is the human wisdom which comes from the right side, and things can change. And it's up to you. In other words, Zoroaster said, there is a mystical power in you that can be used to change the world for the better. You want to stop the hurricanes? You want to stop the earthquakes? You want to stop all the storms that are so destructive? Everybody start thinking positively and start flowing in harmony with nature. It'll stop. And it's up to you. Zoroaster date is kind of placed with a little bit of ambiguity, but somewhere 1,000 to 3,000 years before Jesus Christ. 1,000 to 3,000 years before Jesus Christ, there was a voice that spoke, and he spoke from Persia, which you now know as Iran. He spoke from Iran, and he impacted totally your life. And the thing is, you've gone to church all of your life, and you haven't the slightest idea who he is. Nobody ever told you about him. No preacher ever told you about him. No rabbi ever told you about him. No evangelist has ever told you about him. You went to the New Age, and you got rocks, and you got smoke, and you got feathers, but you don't know anything about him. Nobody ever told you about it. Now you sit here and say, who is this? He was the first voice that spoke out of the deserts of Iran and said that the struggle that is inherent in life is a struggle between light and darkness. Nobody said it before him. Many have said it after him. It's quoted in the Bible all the time. 
And you'll see people get up and stand and they'll say, well, this is a struggle between light and darkness, never knowing that this originated from Zoroaster the Persian prince, Zoroaster the prince of Iran, Zoroaster the prince of Ahura Mazda. And what he said was, light pervaded, but then lies and deception came in. Lies and deception came in. Zoroaster was a living symbol of the truth. He thought according to the law. He spoke according to the law. He was the holiest in holiness above all the living world. The best ruling and exercising who the brightest in brightness was. The most glorious in glory. The most victorious in victory. And at, it says at his sight demons fled. That's what it was said about Zoroaster. At his sight demons fled. The birth of Zoroaster marked the opening of the final 3,000 years of what they call the 12,000 years of the world. It's a time when the Messiah appears to culminate the victory over the lies and to establish the kingdom on earth. When does this happen? As you're sitting here now, you're in the age of Aquarius. Okay? It says in the scriptures, and it says in the same scriptures of Zoroaster, that at the time that the blood reaches the horse's neck, there is 1,000 years of peace. What that means is in the age of Aquarius, when the sun reaches that which is the neck of Pegasus, then all of this peace comes for 1,000 years. That was the teachings of Zoroaster. That was the teachings of Jesus Christ. Go to page 1,014 in the Bible. Look at Revelation chapter 20. 1014, Revelation chapter 20. And look at verse 6. Blessed is holy is he that has part in the first resurrection on such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. That was the teachings of Zoroaster. That's the teachings of your Bible. The reason that it is in your Bible is because it originated with Zoroaster. That there would be a change. Something was going to happen. And it was going to happen during the age of Aquarius. And it was going to happen when the energy of the sun touched the neck of Pegasus. Then there was going to be a change in the way you think. That's why you're sitting in here. That's why you're sitting here. That's why you're listening to me. That's why we share with one another. That's why the thoughts that come into your mind now aren't, you're not thinking the way you used to think. You're not reading the way you used to. You look at this Bible. You know what you have? You spent your whole life reading this Bible literally. You've spent your whole life reading this Bible literally. You believe the words that you saw in the Bible not knowing that these words are symbolic and they're not supposed to be read literally. And so you made up all of these stories and then you had preachers make up stories and you got stories of fish swallowing people. There was a story in here of a fish swallowing a man. He stays in the intestines of the fish three days. The fish pukes, the evangelist pops out and you bought it. You say, yeah, this is it. This is my faith. My faith is built on this. You got two English people named Adam and Eve running around in a, in a garden somewhere with no clothes on. A snake comes, gives her an apple, she eats it, and the whole thing goes down the drain. And this is the foundation of your religion, and you wonder why everything's screwed up. And so then people come and they come into church. And do they, does anybody question it? Does anybody stand up and say, hey, tell me, is this what you believe? I mean, is this true? Nobody says what you like, you're looking at me. Hey, none of me. All right, pass the plate, pass the hat. Come up, sign the card, you'll go to heaven. Because all that you've ever expected out of this thing was misery until finally you dropped dead and went to heaven. And you showed up because maybe there is such a place. Not knowing that you were supposed to create the heaven here on this earth by changing it, by making a change. Here's a man that came 4,000 years ago and spoke of this change that could be made by you. And you know what? Not one of your preachers, not one of your pastors ever mentioned his name. You had no idea. If some guy wrote a, an obscure symphony somewhere, so it also speaks of the You don't even know, never even heard of it. It's not interesting to you. It's not that there was anything. Jesus Christ never said anything new. His name wasn't even Je Jehoshua. Never said anything new. Everything he said came from somebody else. 
and the person that said it before him got it from somebody else. And it all traces itself back, and you can trace it back to the very, very beginning, whenever the big burp happened and all of this stuff started coming down all over the earth. So we say, Here's the answer. This is what you do. This is what you do. And so what do we do? The thing that is apparent is that all of the aspects of Christianity are the same aspects that came from Zoroaster one to two thousand years before Jesus was born. What I'm saying to you is everything that you'll find in the Bible attributed to Jesus Christ originated with this strange voice that came out of Iran one thousand to two thousand years before Jesus was born. The influences of this prophet and Ahira Mazda are mind-boggling when you consider the impact that they had on the Judeo-Christian ethic, directly related to Zoroaster and Ahira Mazda. Let me tell you what Zoroaster was responsible for. Do you believe, I know you do, or at least the religious do, the Christians do, that Moses originated the Ten Commandments? No, he didn't. No, he did not. They were originated by a gentleman by the name of Ezra. And Ezra was the Jew who was in captivity in Babylon. And Ezra became a follower of Zoroaster and the Hura Mazda. And Ezra became proficient. Do you know that prior to coming into captivity in Babylon, God's chosen people wandered around collecting rocks? They knew nothing, they accomplished nothing, they wrote nothing. They were rock pilers. Split rocks, moved rocks, and wandered. And what did they do? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know where I'm going, but I'm going. And I'm going to get there. I'm at the promised land. Here I am. I'm getting busy. Where is it? And they wind up in Babylon. And you know what happened when they wind up in Babylon? They come out as scholars. They went to the pagan Babylon of Zoroaster and the God's chosen people that were rock splitters came out of Babylon as scholars. And this one here came out with the law. And this is the Ten Commandments that you read in the Bible were authored by Ezra in Babylon under the stewardship of Zoroaster, the god of Hira Mazda, and the great king of Iran, Artaxerxes. The temple! <laughs> Why, the temple was constructed as, this is the whole thing. It's going to rebuild the temple, the temple of the Jews. Tell you, who was responsible for reconstructing the temple of the Jews? Our friend, Zoroaster. Had nothing to do with the Jews. Had nothing to do with Moses. Had nothing to do with Jerry Falwell. Had nothing to do with the Christians or the Catholics or the Protestants. It had to do with the strange voice that came out of Iran thousands of years ago. And this voice came down to the king of Persia. The king of Iran, whose name was... Cyrus, and he said, build the temple. He was a follower of Zoroaster and Ahira Mazda. <laughs> the one you know is Jesus. Oh, little town of Bethlehem, how sweet the flows. I came upon a midnight clear. Oh, the little holy night. Ba, 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 ba. And then the big part of this thing. We three kings of Orient are. Blop, blop, blop here in a jar. <laughs> Guess where they came from? Guess where they came Do you know who the three kings were? The Magi. <coughs> Do you know who was the Persian prophet prince of the tribe of Magi? Zoroaster. What have you got that's original, Christian? Fakakta, you got nothing. <laughs> you originated nothing. You originated not the law. It was originated through Zoroaster. You originated not the temple. It was originated through Zoroaster. And you didn't even originate the kingship of Jesus Christ. It was originated through Zoroaster. And I'll tell you what Zoroaster was. The Persian prophet, prince of the Magi, they were astrologers. That's why it said, we have seen his star in the east. Meaning, in Iran, in Persia, we have studied the stars, we understand them, and we see the sign Coma in, in, in Virgo, and we have followed that, and this leads us to this place of the kingdom, the child. The king, the child with it. All came out of a place. And here's the thing, how old are you? You know the thing is, nobody ever told you this. 
And you've gone to church and you take your kids because I want my kids to get in it. I want them to know our faith. Do you know? You don't even know what your faith is. You have no idea that your faith is attributed to this guy Zoroast. Zoro who? I don't know Zoro. And you know, this is the amazing thing. This is a documented. I'm gonna. We're gonna look at the Bible and prove this. This is amazing. But it's in the Bible. It's a documented proof of historical accuracy. And you know what? You couldn't walk into one Christian church and tell them. They'd freak. They'd throw you out. They'd call the cops. <laughs> don't talk. We don't want to hear it. I want to hear it. I'm not listening. I'm not listening. Oh, I'm not listening. I was raised a Catholic. I'll be born a Catholic. I'll die a Catholic. It's like my mother was. I'm raised a Catholic, born a Catholic, die a Catholic. I've never set foot in the church. Last time she went to the church, the priest threw a Bible at her. That's true. My, my, my mother had a... Had a, she had, well, we, we went to these church Catholic schools, and she had a, uh, one of my brothers got in trouble with the priest. And so my mother went down. She was a very tough woman. And she, I guess she was going to take a poke at this guy. Something, something happened, and he threw a Bible at her. And that was it. She never showed up again. But she made us go, you will not miss. Why don't you go? Hey, you go. That's the way it was. But see, I had to wait. You see, why, why, do, why, do, why, why do your children, you know what? You would even be afraid to teach. Why do your children have to wait until they're 50 years old before somebody tells them the truth? I mean, if you told them the Easter Bunny brings candy, Santa Claus brings toys, and Jesus died for you. Well, you've lied about two out of three, probably lied about all three. Who's to believe you? And when is somebody going to have the... See, the point is, you couldn't tell them the truth because the system doesn't want them to know this. You know? Because how would it be if you find out that your religious tradition does not come from Jerusalem, does not come from Rome, comes from Iran. And there's a guy with a white beard and a black hat saying, I adore you so. Yeah. <laughs> what do you do with that? What do you do with that? <sighs> you don't have to depend on New Age bookstores to find this out either. It's right in here. It's in the book. It's in the Bible. King James Bible. Did I tell you King James was a homosexual? <laughs> oh, where did you hear that? And there's some guy sat in the back. Where did you hear that? I, I spent my life digging up stuff like that. <laughs> it's true. King James is a homosexual. Don't you think the Pope should have caught on when Michelangelo was putting all those nude statues of these guys hanging out? You know. yeah. Well, he's all over the place. Hey, Mike, uh, you got any with shorts? <laughs> nah, nah. I mean, big ones, too, this guy. He, he... I, I, I think... I, I honestly... Uh... Did he do the stuff down at the Caesar's Palace? <laughs> you know what? And when you can laugh at it, when you've got the courage to laugh at this stuff, then you're free. When you've got the courage not to be so damn serious about it and laugh about it and understand it, then you're free. Because then you're going to start to know the truth. Somebody said, oh, that's a sacrilege. Eh, so, so let it be a sacrilege. So what? <laughs> it's funny. And it's true. But see, the funny thing is it wouldn't be so doggone funny if it wasn't true. But it is. <laughs> Here's the Last Supper. Do you have the most magnificent painting? The most magnificent painting ever made in the history of Christianity. The Last Supper. And they're all there. You know, and all of a sudden. And here's the guy painting this. The most magnificent painting. And the guy is Leonardo da Vinci. Guess what? He was gay. And not only was he gay, he was an astrologer. He painted uh, Judas as, as uh, Scorpio, the eighth sign, and he pointed him the eighth from the right. That's why if you count him, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, there you find Judas. But suddenly in this age, we reveal all of these things and we become true. But here then we can trace all of our beliefs and all of our foundations back to a source. Once you trace yourself back to the source, then you can start realizing, hey, wait a minute that the people of these parts of the world are the same as I am. There is no reason that we should be separated and fighting and killing one another. We've been caused to do that by contemporary religion. Um, let me just show you. So, so you, can look in the, you can look in the Bible and see for yourself because I have never, and you know this, 
I have never told you anything that I couldn't document. Now, we have a librarian here. Sir, I guess she can lead you to the uh, historical parts of the... Can you show them where the history books are in the Bible so they can look up King James and see what he was up to uh, after he got done looking the Bible over? <laughs> uh, but you can look and, and we document everything. I have no trouble with people calling me up. I'm not, I, have, I have, you know, kind of people that think I'm nuts, and that's okay. But I don't, I don't really have any priests or ministers or rabbis or, 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 or uh, evangelists calling me up because it's all documented. Now, when I say here, we talk about the temple, the most important, well, the most important part of the, uh, of the Bible concerning the, the Jews and the chosen people is the building of the temple. That is, that is paramount, the building of the temple. So you would think, who would God pick? A Jew? That would seem appropriate to pick a Jew. Well, any Christian yet, but we could pick, you know, somebody from the Bible, you know, some, some Bible character from the Holy Land to build the Jew. Because we're going to build the temple in Israel, right? Who do we get? Watch. Go to page 403. It's a, it's, a, it's a book that we don't read too often, uh, kind of remote, and it's called Second Chronicles. Uh, it documents kind of stuff, you know. I've never really gotten too deeply involved in it. But anyhow, Second Chronicles, go to page, you'll get to Second Chronicles, and then uh, you're on chapter 36, okay? Chapter 36 in Second Chronicles, and look what it says. Look at verse 23. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia. This is the king of Iran. All the kingdoms of the earth have the Lord God given to me. Friends, I want to tell you something. Cyrus, okay, was a devotee and follower of the Lord God, Ahura Mazda. Mazda means light. Did you ever see it in a light bulb? Mazda light bulb? That's what I got so Cyrus, Lord God was a hero. So in other words, a hero Mazda told Cyrus, build the temple. You should build the temple. And he says, okay, we'll do it. He has charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? The Lord his God be with him and let him go up. Let him go up. Let him raise himself up. Because where is the temple? You have a finger on your right hand. The only temple God lives in, according to the Bible, is a temple that's not made with hands, and it's right here on the side of your head. That's the temple you've got to go. This is where the temple's got to be constructed, right here. But in the, in the allegory, we find out that a strange guy by the name of Cyrus, and Cyrus is the, and this is the funny part of this. You want to hear something funny? You can't document Jesus ever lived. You can't document Moses ever lived. You can't document David ever lived. You can't document Solomon ever lived. You certainly can't document Peter, Paul, and Mary and all of these people that are supposed to run around here, the English people. The only one of the few people in the Bible that you can document an actual, actual existence for is a guy named Cyrus. He lived. You can go to his grave. You can find his grave. And not only that, you can find out where he was killed. He was killed in a skirmish at the northeast border of Iran and Iraq or wherever it was. He died. So he was given this authority to build the temple. Why? Now, just what I'm asking you, some think for just a minute. Don't read. Think for just a minute. Think as I ask you, why then did the God, the traditional God of your religion, pick this guy to build the temple? What was the reason? What was the purpose? Why not, you know, why not a Jew? No. Why not somebody that in the Bible tradition that we know? No. Here is picked a follower of a strange God. When you say in your Bible, thou shalt not have strange gods before me. If I tell you this was a strange God by the name of Ahura Mazda, and he was the one that selected to build the temple. Why? Then who, where does all of this lead you? Where's your traditions? Where's your religion? Where's your fundamentalism? Where's your Protestants and Catholics and Methodists and Baptists and all of this stuff? Because none of it says a word about Ahura Mazda. None of it says a word about Zoroaster. None of it says a word except what is in here. This, and you know what? You never, nobody ever questions. Who the heck is Cyrus? Why was Cyrus picked? Cyrus is the king of Iran. Cyrus says, and today Cyrus would be a Muslim. He's the guy they picked. Why? You did. Look at uh, 
page 406 in the book of Ezra. Once you get to the point of finding out that your religion and their religion is exactly the same, then you can put your guns down. Then you can stop shooting at one another and, and you can, you can kind of sit down and talk things over. Ezra chapter 4, you're in verse 3. Zerubbabel and Joshua, in that name, and the rest of the chief of the fathers of Israel said unto them, You have nothing to do with us to build a house unto our God, but we ourselves together will build unto the Lord God of Israel as King Cyrus the king of Persia has commanded us. Is that what I'm So it just takes everything that you ever believed and it carts it into the men's room and the ladies' room, it places it in the toilet, and it flushes it away. It says it's all off. Because the direction for the very foundation of your religion comes out of Iran. It comes out of the, out of the wisdom of Cyrus and Zoroaster. And not only that, but it would make the Lord God of Israel a hero Mazda. Think of that. It would make the Lord God of Israel a hero Mazda. So try to understand, if you can, try to understand. That's the temple, all right? Real quickly, the law. The Ten Commandments. I don't think there's one of you that walked through that door, except some of you who have been here before. There's not one of you that walked through that door that if I said to you, who wrote the Ten Commandments, what would you say? Moses. Do you know there's not one shred, not one bit of documentation for the existence ever of a person by the name of Moses? And I'll tell you something else. The person who was called Moses as that which represents the Jewish law, it says about him, he was skilled in all of the wisdom and enlightenment of the Egyptians. Which means he was a mystic. Whoever it was, whoever he was. Okay? But let's take a look at this. Let's take a look in understanding this part of, uh, of what we're, we're getting into about the law. Look at page 409. First of all, understand something. There was a strange guy named Ezra. He was, in he was in captivity in Babylon and Iran or Persia, whatever you want to call it. He was interested in the law. And look what it says on page 409 in the book of Ezra, Ezra chapter 7. In Ezra chapter 7, look what it says in verse 6. This Ezra went up from Babylon, and he was a ready scribe in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given. And the king granted him all his request according to the hand of the Lord his God upon him. Okay? And it says there that in Ezra chapter 7, verse 6, he went up some of the children of Israel and the priests and Levites and all of the into Jerusalem. And he sought to teach, look at verse 10, for Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. So this guy Israel, uh, this guy Ezra is going to make statutes and judgments. All right. Okay, that's, that's the next part. Now look at verse 12. Artaxerxes, king of kings unto Ezra the priest, a scribe of the law of the God of heaven, perfect peace and at such a time. Artaxerxes is now the king of Iran, king of Babylon. Babylon is Iraq, Persia is Iran. Artaxerxes is the king of Babylon. Okay. So now we have, a, we have a brief different player because now we have what is commonly called Iran. This here today, in other words, if it was today, do you know who would be given Ezra permission to do this? Saddam Hussein. Do you know what I'm saying to you? Artaxerxes was the Saddam Hussein of that day. He was in control of Iraq. And Artaxerxes said to Ezra, put the law together. And then Artaxerxes says, and I'll put out a decree that everybody better obey it. Okay? Look at verse uh, 21. I, even I, Artaxerxes, think of him as Saddam Hussein, the king, do make a decree to all the treasurers which are beyond the river that whatsoever Ezra, the scribe of the law of the God of heaven, shall require of you, it be done speedily. And in verse 25, it says, Ezra, 
after the wisdom of your God that is on hand set magistrates and judges which may judge all the people. Judge, you're going to be judged. Who's the judgment going to be by? Saddam Hussein <laughs> and all of his group from Iraq as he gives witness unto Ezra. You go out and make the law and I'll see that it's implemented. That's where your law came from. And good, what did Jesus Christ, Yeshua, say when he came to, I have come to fulfill the law. Iraq and Iran. Saddam Hussein, Ayatollah Khomeini is the foundation of your religion. And it's in the Bible. And so, what are we, so, where, so where's all your traditions come from? You know where all your traditions came from? You made them up. You took all of this stuff from Iraq and Iran, Babylon and Persia, and you made it your little Christian thing. You put a little white wooden church with stained glass on the side of it and a thing up in the air. You know what that is. And on top of it, and then you said, how do I know? The Bible told me so. And you convinced yourself that you had constructed this religion that was the true religion and was going to save everybody. And you never ever were aware that the whole thing came out of Saddam Hussein and Ayatollah Khomeini out of Iraq and Iran. And not only that, we could be excused if we said, well, gee, nobody told us. It's in the book. It's in the Bible. You know who didn't teach you? Your teachers, your ministers, your priests, your rabbis. You're evangelist. Nobody mentioned this. Because when they do mention it, it blows the whole thing. What did these guys have to do with all of this? How come all of this stuff came from how come all of this stuff came from Ahura Mazda and Iraq and Iran? How come where what did these guys have to do with it? Oh, I don't know. I never see, and if I go tell this stuff, they'll say, Don't listen to that guy. Don't listen, don't listen to any of that stuff. I, you don't have to listen to it. Find it in the Bible. You looked at it yourself. You saw that Cyrus was commissioned to build the temple. He was a follower of Hiura Mazda. You saw that Ezra was commissioned to do the law. He was a follower of Hiura Mazda under King Artaxerxes. And you saw that King Artaxerxes, who was the king of Iraq at the time, is the one that authored the law to come into Israel. You can't discount all of this under the authority of Hiura Mazda. Now, we've come through who was Zarastar. You got a pretty good idea. You've come through the temple. You've come through the law. And now the one, Jesus. This is the most disgusting part of the whole thing. I saw him on television the other night in Christian television. And the guy was playing, his name was Paul Crouch. He said, we claim this in the mighty, precious name of Jesus. His name wasn't Jesus. His name wasn't Jesus. His name was Jehoshua. Pronounce Jeshua. You changed it. It's the mighty, precious, holy name that you couldn't deal with. And the reason you changed his name is because it's too Jewish, Yeshua. We had to make it more Western. We made it Greek. We made it Isios. And not only that, but when you add up the numerical value of the Greek letters of Jesus, it comes out to 888, which is the number of the son. The name Jesus came out of Greek mythology. Who can you tell? I would say I would like to have a council of all the bishops and all the priests and all the popes and all the archbishops and say, can we at least, with all of this man suffering, can we at least do one little thing? I don't want you to become an occultist. I don't want you to become a new age. But can we do one little thing and use the guy's right name? And you know what the answer would be? No. Can't do that. Why? Because of our tradition. And you know what this Jehoshua said? You have made the law of God of no effect by your tradition. What do you do? And you know what? You, no matter how much you even love this, you would be totally uncomfortable. You wouldn't even know who they were talking about. If they come on talking about Yeshua, all of a sudden this would become a very oriental thing. It would become a very eastern thing. It would become something off the desert. And you couldn't be comfortable with that. So you had to make it Greek. And then you have all of your ministers and priests running around abusing little boys. Because you know what? In Greece, that was accepted. You know what I read to the people the other night? Aristotle instructed people, let's cut down on the population explosion. Get yourself a little boy. That was the teachings of Aristotle. And he was quite a, he was no dope. Get a little boy. And if you accomplished in the communities in Greece and you were uh, uh, the elite, you were upper class, you got a boy. 
You couldn't get one if you were lower class. Pedophilia, when, that's all I'm doing tonight. It went rampant in Greece. <laughs> that's what you're talking about tonight. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's not what we're doing. It's what we're doing. <laughs> No, but I mean, you know, doesn't you know, doesn't it doesn't two and two seem to make four? If if you embrace the culture here, if you embrace the mythological culture here, and you reject that which is the culture that God gave, then all of a sudden you find yourself embracing all of these other traditions too. And so when the priests have little boys behind the, the, the altar and all of this stuff, they say, Well that went on in Greece all the time. That's where it came from. So, Jehoshua. This one that is known as Jesus. I'll put it back up because it's still hard for people to tell. Jesus. Watch. We'll wrap this up. Page 777. We started this thing off this morning talking about Zoroaster. Zoroaster was the Persian prophet prince of Iran. Zoroaster was the prince of the tribe of Magi. Magi, the root of the word Magi, it's the root of the word magician. They were astrologers. Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. The wise men from the east who came to Jerusalem were the Magi. They were from the tribe of Magi of Iran, and their prince prophet was Zoroaster. They were followers of the god Ahura Mazda. They saw his sign in the star. Who sent them? Ahura Mazda. That's God's name. Nobody ever told you that. All the time you've been coming to church, all the time you've been reading Bibles, nobody ever told you his name. And you know what? Let me show you how stupid Americans are and how stupid the people of the West are. God has a name. His name was Ahura Mazda. What do you call him? God. Him, God. Well, what's his name? Him, God. It's like Tarzan and Jane, her girl, him boy, him cheetah, him God. <laughs> Nobody ever, oh, I don't know. No, no, just think of that. Did anybody ever tell you what God's name was? I don't know. Everybody, every religion on the face of the earth knows God's name. You know, don't call him Allah. You know, don't call him Ahura Mazda, that's a nice name for God. I think that's nice. You can even call that. I think it would be a nice name for a car. I got a 1994 Ahura Mazda. <laughs> Wasn't there a car named a Mazda? Yes. There you go. But no, so what do you say? Let's think up a beautiful name. I know. We call him God. You know what God means? Good. We couldn't even get clever enough to think up a name. So we did. <laughs> I know name. We race here. That's his name. God, good. What about the bad guy? What about evil? Oh, we got to think up a clever name. How? Put D there. Call him Devo, devil. <laughs> clever, aren't we? We thought up all of this stuff by ourselves. And then they get 10% of your money to tell you that. That's the funny thing. Jesus. All right. When this happens then, did I show you this? Okay, the wise men came from these. That, 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 they were the... Uh, they were the uh, uh, Magi. The temple that Cyrus constructed was a symbol of the temple that is here, which is the temple, which is consciousness. And it was Jesus, Jehoshua, who came into the temple and demonstrated two things. There was two things Jesus, Jehoshua, demonstrated in that temple. One, he says, you've made it a den of thieves. It's not talking about selling anything there. It was talking about that which goes on in here. Second thing that he got so ticked off about is that they were selling animals inside the temple. And he just threw everything out. And he said, it's got to be pure. And that symbol of Jesus, Jehoshua, driving the money sellers out of the temple is a symbol of you driving the thoughts out of your mind and your meditation. So Jesus said to Peter, who do they say I am? He said, you are the Christ based on the temple, fulfill over the law discovered by the Magi. The Christ of who? The Christ of the astrologers. You can't change that, folks. There's nothing you can do about it. 
It was astrologers who found him. Astrologers who said he was the king. Astrologers who said we read it. And said, it doesn't make any difference whether you like it or not. People say use cosmology. And I, well, don't, don't beat around the bush. Come right out and say, these guys were astrologers. They read the stars. While, while, I'll tell you something. While God's chosen people were chipping rocks somewhere in the middle of the desert, these people were d defining the universe. While God's chosen people were out there trying to find a porta potty somewhere in the middle of the desert, these people had actually cosmologically put together the entire zodiac. See what I'm saying? And you're looking for wisdom? And nobody ever told you that. And the only time that God's chosen people finally reached the point of wisdom and understanding is when they were put into captivity by God to learn. Who was the God that put them into captivity? Obviously, it was a hero monster who said, you people are fakakta. I'm going to take you to Babylon, and you're going to stay there for 400 years, and you're going to learn. You're going to learn how to read. You're going to learn how to write. You're going to learn mathematics. You're going to learn law. You're going to learn cosmology. And when they came out of Babylon, they were intelligent people. Remember that. But it was thousands upon thousands of years while these people were running around looking to find a rock to hide under that it was the Babylonians, the Iraqis, and the Iranians who were the people of wisdom and who had constructed the entire zodiac and could trace and chart the stars and chart the seasons and chart the eclipses and the ellipses and all of these things when there was not one Jew that even knew which way, which way is Israel. I don't know where, but I don't know what. And so this Hahira Mazda, which is the God of all things, decreed there's only one thing we can do with these people. Bring them home to Babylon and teach them. And then once we get them taught, Cyrus, you build them a temple. Uh, get this guy Ezra, he's pretty sharp. Get him instructed in our ways and we'll send him in with the law. And then when all of that was done, there's a child that must be born within. Send the Magi, send the astrologers, and we'll let them know about it. All of it, all of it, every single bit of that which is precious to the foundation of your religion, the law, the temple, the Christ, comes from the sages of Iraq and Iran, Babylon and Persia. Ahira Mazda, Zarastra. So there. Thank you very much for sharing this time and <clears throat> some strange things. However, you know, the, the beautiful thing that you should do go out and get to the library, get a book or whatever. And there's plenty of books. You can find plenty of books about Zoroaster and get you a copy of the music and let that play while you're listening. And uh, study this stuff and understand it. And uh, you'll become, I think, much more enamored with the people of the East and you won't consider them enemies anymore.